very pleased to welcome, in person this evening, Maureen Jennings, an award-winning author who's written 13 crime novels, one novella, one book of nonfiction, and four plays that have been professionally produced. Many of us are familiar with her first series set in Victorian Toronto and adapted for television as the Murdoch Mysteries. She's written and co-written seven scripts for this series, and Murdoch continues to be a very popular series on CBC. Maureen has written a contemporary series about forensic profiler Christine Morris, set in Scotland and Aurelia, and a series of novels set in England during the Second World War, featuring DCI Tom Tyler. The second novel in this series, Beware the Boy, inspired the TV series Bomb Girls, which ran for three years on Global and won Best Movie of the Week in its third season, and in its first season, won the U.S. Gracie Award. Maureen's work has run several awards and been nominated eight times from the Crime Writers of Canada. Her love of history has been recognized with a certificate of commendation from Heritage Toronto, and her contributions to the genre of crime fiction has been recognized by the Grant Allen Award. We are fortunate that Maureen and her family emigrated from the United States, uh, from the United Kingdom to Canada when she was a teenager. Ouch. And we are fortunate <laughs> that she began writing full time after a long career as a psychotherapist. But mostly, we are very fortunate to have her speaking to us in person this evening. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you. Dylan. I'm so wired, I might explode at any minute. Okay, making sure, first of all, that everyone can hear me from... Yes, good. Oops, that sounds loud to me, but I guess it's not. Well, I am absolutely delighted to be here. I always assume that people who take the trouble to join a historical society like history and that your eyes won't roll in your head when I show you all my treasures. And also, the fact that we are now getting out from under um, our long sequestering. And I thought that it might be good then for all of us that if I read you a little bit from this book, it's called Our Deportment. It was written in 1898, and it will tell you how to behave now that you are back in company. And we could literally probably just sit and read this whole thing, but I won't. Okay, I will. this is instructions, and the heading is conversation. So if you find yourself now, you're somewhere and you're not used to this, and you want to have a conversation, this is how to do it. <clears throat> Do not go into society unless you make up your mind to be sympathetic, unselfish, animating, as well as animated. Society does not require mirth, but it does demand cheerfulness and unselfishness. And you must help to make and sustain cheerful conversation. So there, you take that with you when you go out, perhaps for the first time in ages. And I also wanted to tell you a couple of other things, just in case you have forgotten. It says here, uh, if you go, are invited for dinner, uh, someone invites you for dinner, don't sit there and pick your teeth. It's, it's not very good, com good company. Uh, and the other thing which I must say, it says don't, sit in company and read your book. <laughs> now, I think unfortunately now we say don't look at your iPhone, right? But anyway, uh, the other thing is, perhaps not as true here, but certainly true in, Tor in Toronto, there's a little uh, instruction on how to be on a streetcar. And I'm sorry, you, you all know what this is like, I'm sure. It says, Make sure that you leave room for other people to sit down. So I, I like that. I thought that was a good thing to start. So what I would like to do is kind of 
ramble a little bit. And please, at any point, if you wish to interject, which is a polite way of saying interrupt, put my head down. Don't put your head down. <laughs> Oh dear, sorry, uh, anyway, all right, so, and I have lots of things to show you which I, I, I really hope that you will enjoy as much as I have enjoyed them. Now, I have some of these, at least one of these I've used before, so if I do show it to you and you've seen it before, please don't tell anybody. This, I just want the uninitiated, okay? <laughs> All right. So, what I'm going to show you is oops, a photograph, a genuine photograph. And I'm going to, I'm going to walk around in a minute. And I want you to guess what it is that all of these people are watching. Think of yourselves, it's not dissimilar place, location. They are very dressed up. I don't notice anybody in the audience here who's wearing a fox fur, but you can see that they are. So, but I'm gonna hide what they are watching. So if you've seen it before, don't say anything. And just guess, what are these well-dressed up people? Room is completely jammed. What are they looking at? What have they come out to watch? These are very good guesses, but they're wrong. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yep. They are watching a typewriting competition. <laughs> a typewriting competition. I actually love showing this photograph because so many of the things that I'd like to show you tonight, I see them as like little doors and we go through into a completely different world. And I can't really imagine any of us saying, you know what, dear, there's, there's a keyboard exhibition tonight. Let's go and watch somebody key in on their computer. Ooh, that sounds like fun. I'm gonna wear my tuxedo. <laughs> But this is literally a genuine photograph. You can see, I think, that the competitor is wearing evening clothes. Uh, this is, um, he's doing a dictation. There were two different kinds of competitions. Um, and this was one, just to dictate. The other was a copy, just to have your copy and you had to copy. All right, delve into your past just a little. And those of you who were good typists, tell us how fast you could go. Anybody? Okay, let's find out who was typing way back there. Okay, how fast? How many? 120 words. That's fantastic. That is, that is competition speed. She, she couldn't spell, but she could type. <laughs> All marks were deducted for mistakes, of course. But, but they, for a, quite a long time, we actually used this. I, I used this in one of the episodes. But for quite a long time, these competitions were very, very popular, and they got a lot of money. They all had their own typewriters and they'd sort of refine them so they were hair trigger. This is pre-electric typewriter. And I, I thought that was really nice. I see some nods. Did you do that? No, you don't know that. Okay. All right. I'm gonna show you some more things in a minute. Um, I thought very quickly I'd tell you how it all started for me. Okay, I guess it started because I wrote two plays, two plays, started with two plays, started with um, a very dear friend of mine who is an actor and was working with a theater company. And at the time, I, I'd always been a reader, but I had never, I grew up in England and no one considered writing a career, especially if you're a female. You could be a teacher, a nurse, um, that's about it. 
There must have been something else. Anyway, uh, so th I never, no one would ever say to me, gosh, you know, have you thought of being a writer? I never thought about it. So that went on and on and on until, but I always read voraciously. I read uh, mystery stories a lot and I loved the theater. So my dear friend came to me one day and he said, look, you love mysteries, you love the theater, this company is looking for a mystery play, why don't you write a mystery play? Sure, why don't you grow a little bit, you know? <laughs> it seemed so out of the question, but it was true that I really did love the theater and the mystery genre. So I ended up writing for this theater, it was called Solar Stage. The first thing was called The Black Ace. And why I'm so grateful for doing that, it was a very unusual setup. Uh, it was up in uh, North York, and it was surrounded by business offices, business people. And so they did what they called lunchtime theater. And what this meant was that people literally had to get their lunch and then leave. So it, the play had to be short. It had to be under 50 minutes and it had to be a serial. So at the end of each week, I had to create a hook so that people would come back the next week, obviously. And so it was a very, very valuable learning experience. I started out writing a historical mystery only because I thought it would be easier than trying to get into something forensics, which was true. But by the time I had researched all of that, I was really hooked. And so when the play ended, I did another one called No Traveler Returns, and that play has been remounted three times. And that was, again, I keep saying I learned such a lot by doing that, of how hopefully doing what they call the hook so that people would come back. And there's one other thing that I'd love to share with you because it was in a certain way one of the most important things, you know, lots of things are very important to guide one. Okay, so in a play you sit around, first of all, they call it a table read. So it's literally like this. And all of the actors have their script and they've, you know, uh, highlighted their part. And uh, it was a small stage, much, much smaller than this. And I knew that I had too many people on stage. So again, as a very neophyte person, I simply wrote a little direction, exit Binden. That's all, get off the stage in other words. So we're sitting around and this lovely actor says to me, well, where do I go? What do you mean, where do you go? You get off the stage. And he said, well, because he's in the story. He said, well, do I go up to the woods and look for footprints? And I'm going, ah. But what he taught me was this, all actors do this. They call this their backstory. So you can't, they all have to have a long history, even though you might give them two lines. They bring in their whole backstory. And that was a very valuable lesson because even now, I, when I'm writing, I will often divide my page if I'm making notes and I'll go off stage, on stage. And I make sure, I hope, that all of my characters have a backstory. So that if I have to send them somewhere, I know where they're going. They're going up to the woods to check the footprints <laughs> or whatever it is. And I found that living in Toronto has been very valuable because even though it's changed dreadfully, um, I can still get a sense of what that old place was like. And I always, always walk the path of my characters. So I know that if I'm saying in the book, it took her 20 minutes, it really does. And that it doesn't take two hours or 10 minutes or something like that. And by the way, we have filmed a lot in Coburg, have we not? I remember being here for an early episode so I forget what it was called now, but it involved a robot walking down Coburg Street. Did anyone see that? Why is that? Yeah, you did. Okay, great. Anyway, so it all started like that, 
and I, I loved it. Um, I was still working uh, professionally as a, a psychotherapist, and then I began to realize that, okay, as a therapist, you really do have to walk the talk. You've got to be very aware of your own weaknesses, desires, and so on. And I thought, here am I trying to help people get to where they really want to be, and I'm not sure I'm doing that. So I started to phase out and, and entered into being a full-time writer. So one of the things, again, if any of you are writing, and I think some of you are, I must say that one of the most valuable research tools are instruction books. Because instruction books will tell you what wasn't known and what they knew. And I'm going to share some instruction. I'm going to give you that one in a minute. OK. This is especially for Jennifer. Where are you? OK. This is one of the most extraordinary books I've ever found. And I swear that some of these books we could spend the entire evening on without getting bored. This is called The Nautical Cookery Book. And it is for the use of stewards and cooks of cargo vessels. Incredible. So, OK, this is another of those, you know, I say you step into history. All right, so what I thought I'd do, just for fun. OK, here's another quiz. You didn't know you'd be quizzed tonight, did you? OK. Does anybody here in this audience know what was potato snow? You don't? Good, because I didn't have a clue either. Anyone guess? Come on, you, yes. Uh, potato out of those ricers? Brilliant. That's absolutely what it was. <laughs> well done. It, I presume it was a bit like a mincer. But it says here, wash, peel, and boil some potatoes, drain them, press them through a snow machine <laughs> into a vegetable dish. I, so I guess they'd come out sort of like mashed potatoes, wouldn't they? Yeah. Is that, have you done it? Have you? I've seen that, yeah. All right, OK. Um, let me just do another couple of things. All right, just for fun. This page, just anybody call out a page number, be under 200, and um, I'll tell you what the recipe is. 87. 87, okay. And it's, it's all in categories. As I said, we could do, okay. <laughs> okay. Do you know, where was, who called out 87? Okay, do you know what was Cambridge sausage. No, I didn't either. A minced up professor. What? A minced up professor. <laughs> A minced up professor. A minced up professor. <laughs> We're suddenly in Sweeney Todd territory here. Anyway, it was some kind of minced up pork and uh, this and that and the other and you shape it into sausages, coat it with egg and breadcrumbs, and fry in deep fat. <laughs> anyway, I, I could go on and on, but it's very funny, because a lot of them I have never heard of. I haven't even tried to make some of them. Potato snow really got to me, though. Um, they use things that now, I, I don't, again, as anyone, OK, you, you don't have to confess if you don't want to. But has anyone here ever cooked calf's head? No. Has anybody here ever made brain cakes? The same professor, I think. <laughs> anyway, this book, uh, I, I'm using this book in my new series because it takes place, a lot of it, in a cafe. So this gives me a lot of chance to have fun with some of these recipes, which it's not that long ago that, well, this was 1940, and this was a bit on the ship. And another thing that, of course, it says is um, 
they, there's a bill, bill of fare, as they called it at the end, uh, and there's a, re, uh, there's a bill of fare for the guests. They would carry guests. They're mostly um, working boats, but they carry guests. And then there's a bill of fare for the crew, which, uh, just a quick example, the crew would get porridge, bread and butter, and kippers. The officers might get fish cakes, and that was that. The, the guests would get, um, for breakfast, they would get <laughs> porridge, liver and bacon, poached eggs on toast, fr fried fillets of steak, bubble and squeak, rice cakes, rolls and toast. That was the guest. <laughs> anyway, that one could go on. So, the other thing that I wanted to share with you is it's not only the content of my books that are, is amazing sometimes. There are sometimes things inside them. So this is an example, and you've perhaps had this kind of experience yourself. The book is a field service booklet that was printed in 1914. And this is intended for young officers to study and to know what they were doing. And it lit this is a real one. This is not a facsimile. So I get this book. And inside, there was a photograph. And it says, for prudence with best love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In, and you'll see, you can have a look at these after. You can see how young this soldier looks. He looks 18. Anyway, it was in there. So I have found the most interesting things. And that, that gives me a little coup here to, oh, sorry. Oh, it's here. Show you. I don't know if anyone, I get uh, used books all the time. And as I said, sometimes people have used them as bookmarks or whatever. This one, oh dear, <laughs> say oh dear, okay. I don't even remember what book this is, was in. It says, God bless you. It's a religious postcard. But again, what is so touching, it's, there's a date, um, December 1915. And it says, my dearest Grace, I know that the words upon this postcard will leave you, sorry, will please you from your loving boy, Homer. Loving boy, you know, that was, just, it sounds, we will never perhaps really ever know, but I, I don't think it would have been a son. It's quite romantic, the, the language. And, Young men were typically called the boys. My boy is overseas. But I thought that was, it is handwritten. That was really lovely. And this is another beautiful handwritten prayer that I found. And this, I brought this along to show you. This was actually in an old Eaton's catalog. And why I loved it, there are two reasons. Uh, it's, there's an address on the, it was obviously an envelope. It says, Miss Vera Kondrat, Post Office, Kelo, Manitoba. Can you imagine anything with so brief an address getting to its destination now? <laughs> Post Office, Coburg. Anyway, what was also nice, she's obviously been checking the catalog and she's worked out what she wants to order. And there's, there's a price there. I, I really like that. OK. You ready for another test? Now, again, I, I'm, I have shown this before. And if by any chance you have seen it, just hold off. Of this book, I keep tripping over this thing. This book is one of the most extraordinary books I've ever had. And I call all of them my treasures. And I think this is definitely my treasure. And the reason I'm going to show you. It was written 
It was published in 1916. I, I did a lot of work in the, that time period, by the way, which I can tell you about later. The contents of the book are very interesting um, in itself. Okay, so in the front, not unexpected, is the name of the person who owned the book, A.G. Montgomery, May the 15th, 1916, Toronto. Not that unusual to have that in the front of a book. But this is where the treasure comes. At the back of the book, same name, A.D. Montgomery, with his address, which turns out to be very, very close to where I live. And then he's also written something else. And this is where your little test comes in. Does anyone, I'm going to walk around, does anyone know, can you recognize what it is? Where's that typist? I'll come back to you. <laughs> can you see? Oh, yes, it's shorthand, and all, all I can remember is dear sir. All right, it's shorthand. It's Pittman's shorthand. Did they get Pittman's? Yeah. It's okay. I'm going to tell you in a minute what he actually wrote. But does, can you translate it? No. Anyone remember their shorthand? Where's that typist going? <laughs> Try Elma. No, Elma. No, no, no. No? Well, it's tiny as well. It's very yes. small. Yeah. Yeah. Before, this word is before. But something. <laughs> Times. That's times. No, I can't carry. <laughs> I can read just a word here and there. No, I, as nope. I said, you're all can remember. Anyone? Yes, to, okay, come on. We'll have one more try, and then I'll tell you what it said. <laughs> it's very small. That's why it's hard to, even if you knew shorthand very well. It's right in the corner there. Tried to enlist. Uh, the people objected. Must, uh, may, James Times went overseas. Very wow. good, well done. Oh my goodness me. You are the first person who's actually been able to, to translate that. As I said, it's very small. I was, had a very hard time finding someone who was familiar enough with Pittman's shorthand that they could translate it, then literally you are the first person. Very close. What it says, September, the date's important, September 1915. And I discovered afterwards, this, it's a young man, um, and so this is what he wrote in shorthand. Tried to enlist, two objected, probably his parents, um, my chums went overseas. And you go, oh, talk about stepping into a world. This young man, why did he write that? You can write a whole novel about that. I did, actually, but <laughs> <laughs> I brought that in later. Um, why is he writing in shorthand? I, I did some research, discovered later that he was a clerk so again, many, many men studied um, secretarial, what we'd say is uh, secretarial. So, uh, but he decided to write it, not in code, but almost in code. And what he says, tried to enlist. Now what I also discovered, he had an older brother, and the brother had died. He was already dead, so in the war. So when this young man, uh, the two people, I'm sure, were his parents, who had, were, had the right and they were allowed to say, no, we are not giving him permission to go overseas. And he did not go overseas. But the last line, 
my chums went overseas. Absolute volumes about the attitude of the time, how people felt. There was all these stories. There was something that I actually put in the book, which I got from a newspaper, addressed as frequently the case to women. Don't let your boy, show him how you feel. Appear before her in uniform and stuff like that. And it's the, that attitude. It's not hard necessarily to find the facts of history, but what intrigues me a lot is to try to get the, the attitude, the feeling, what were people thinking and feeling. And as I say, that often comes from instruction books. Okay, you okay so far? Anyone want to interject? <laughs> Interrupt? It's not polite to, in, to pick your teeth or your nose. And... <laughs> okay, two more very, very, very important books. Um, this one and this one. Um, this has actually been rebound. It's a, the original was a, um, a, a no, it wasn't bound like this. Somebody's name is in the front. And again, I'm sure that you've had this experience. I describe it as a book kind of entering my life, and it changes my life a little bit or a lot. And this book, which is called I Was Hitler's Prisoner, changed my life. And one of the reasons is it was, it was written, uh, published, in 1930, sorry, what was the exact date? 35. And this man, and one of the things, again, I'm sure you know as historians, it's nice to look back and see how far we've come. And sometimes it's depressing to see what's still the same. And unfortunately, that's still going on, isn't it? So what happened here, this man, he was Hungarian, and this is a true, his true memoirs, and uh, he was part of a newspaper, uh, he was a journalist, and at that point it was Hitler, and he didn't like what they were saying. He didn't like this newspaper making criticisms, and so a lot of people, whether they were journalists or just saying things, were swept up, and the word was um, for protective custody. Not protecting them, but protecting society against what they had to say. And this is absolutely searing when he talks about being in prison in Munich, um, and he didn't know why. None of them knew why. Okay, you, you, you're taking pictures. We don't want you to take pictures. Off you go to jail. And many of them died. And of course, this was also at the time, I don't want to make too many comparisons because it's depressing, but this was the time when um, the Nazis were starting to build concentration camps. Dachau was opened and we know then what happened after that. And he writes about that. It is an incredible, incredible book. So that was one. I'm going to show you. You all right so far? Damn. Oh, this one. You'll like this one. OK. Another uh, memoir from uh, somebody in jail, Walls Have Mouths. This was turned out to be a, a bit later, a same idea. A young man was accused of um, passing secrets to the Soviets. He was English and sent to a very long term, like 19 years in jail or something, although it was very iffy as to whether he had done that or what he had done. So he wrote this book later. I don't know when they get time to do this, but never mind. Um, and there's an English writer you probably know of called Compton McKenzie. Very famous writer. So he wrote the preface. When this book came out in 1936, this is pre-war, remember, 
um, Compton McKenzie wrote a preface. And again, this is one of those extraordinary books. You probably can't see, but uh, up here in pencil, there's a little note that says P.C. McKenzie, sorry, that's some, another McKenzie, censored. So, oh, okay, that's interesting. So I open up the book, and I think you probably can see this. Compton McKenzie wrote his preface, and you see the big white chunks there? Censored. They, didn't, they weren't using black at that point. They literally omitted the things he was saying, took them right out. And the reason was, he was quoting the charge. It seemed that innocuous. The young man, McCartney, he was charged with the secrets. And Mackenzie was saying he was charged with, with something like, when, I don't know, because it was censored, but it would be something like um, England's Marine Force, something, nothing really. But that was, that was just the charge. He wasn't saying anything other than this is what McCartney was charged with, and they took it out. They thought, oh, that's too revealing, that's a secret, that's damaging. So all throughout the preface of this book, there are these big white chunks. Now, McCartney's book itself is not censored because he doesn't say anything about state secrets. He just writes about what it's like to be in jail which is horrible, of course, as you can imagine. So that's another of those books that changed things for me. Um, well, I'm gonna stop for a minute and let you talk. So any comments, anything anyone would like to say at the moment? No, shall I just go on then? Yes. Um, this last book that you just uh, were speaking about, um, which, who, who imprisoned him? This was the British. Uh, uh, sorry, yes, it was the, the British, British because he was considered revealing British secrets to the Soviets. Um, probably wasn't. But, what? I'm sorry. The question was who imprisoned him? He actually ended up in a notorious prison. I think it's called Wadsworth. Wandsworth. And... Uh, as I said, it's not an instruction book exactly, but I use instruction books and memoirs all the time because they, they're doors. You go right into what it was like. And, th and this one, I won't, I'm not gonna read much. This is definitely a reprint, but it was written in the 1880s and it's called Life Inside a London Workhouse. That's another life-changing book, I must say. Which brings me to workhouses. All right, that's my latest thing. All right, this is not a quiz, but you, you probably know this Toronto Elm Street. It was until well into the 30s the house of industry. Okay, I know you're gonna feel like you're in school, but I like asking people, do you know why it was called that? No. You do, you're all historians, come on. People had to work. It was the poor house, but, uh, it, and people went there who literally, at this time, no social security, remember? They went there because they were completely destitute and would have starved. So they went into the workhouse but they, especially the men, had to agree to work. And the work was uh, chopping, breaking up stones, chopping wood, and often for the women it was picking oakum. All right, who's ever picked oakum? Good. <laughs> anyway, it's like rope, and they, it was apparently very tedious and, and hard on the hands. But I've got these fabulous pictures um, I'll just show you this, because you cannot read the small print, but you can sure read the large print. Punishments. This is another workhouse. And there were things, uh, it's a very interesting topic, another night about language. 
and how important it is that we can talk to each other. And maybe we felt that a bit more by not being necessarily in person this last couple of years. I'm not sure, but it's a powerful need. And when you go to Kingston, by the way, I, I did a lot of research there because I wrote an episode that was based out of the prison. And one of the things that I discovered again was that rule of silence, you want to oppress people, you want to control them, you don't let them talk to each other. However, so in that case, as you'll, they'll probably tell you, the prisoners all had to walk in a circle for exercise, but at a distance from each other. So they're not allowed to talk. But apparently, they learn to talk almost like ventriloquists, so you can talk without reading your mouth. Amazing, the need to communicate is so powerful. So this whole thing struck me, that is by the way a rule, silence. Or you can only talk, well very, very little. And so there are many p painful, interesting stories of people in a prison or in some situation where they are being oppressed and they communicate. The prisoners often would tap a code on the pipes. And they, it, uh, this chap talks about that a lot. The walls have mouths. He talks about that a lot, how they communicated. And I find that sort of painful but wonderful all at the same time. We need to connect. As long as we don't pick our teeth in company or whatever. <laughs> the hell. All right, so there's so much else to show you. Oh, let me just jump, slightly jump. I'm going to jump twice, and then I want you to talk. Okay, this is a, a facsimile, but this is, it says, this is World War II. What doctors tell you, the doctors tell you what to eat at wartime. Okay, we all know that. We all know fresh vegetables and blah, 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 blah. However, this part really, really struck me. I don't think I've seen this anywhere else. This is another thing to take away with us. A discontented mind produces a rebellious stomach and so spoils digestion. Therefore, don't grumble or quarrel at mealtimes. A meal is a social occasion and an opportunity for appeasement of mind and body. If the two work together in harmony, the efforts of the housewife will not be wasted. This is all, <laughs> all addressed to women. But I love that. I don't know. I've been at dinner parties where there have been rows, and it does spoil your digestion. OK, let me go over here uh, again. OK, I'll start with this. A few years ago, a very dear friend of mine uh, in the UK, we were visiting regularly, and I phoned, and she said, um, there's somebody here you'd like to talk to. Now, that's always a bit awkward. You know, she puts the guy on the other end of the phone before I could say anything. Anyway, this is the guy. And it turns out Howard is, okay, I know, I hope you don't hate me for doing this is what he called a detectionist. Detect, I'm sorry, a detectorist. OK, what's a detectorist? You do know. Yes! <laughs> There's a, a Pittman shorthand person, two A's. You know why? She's going like this. A detectorist is one of those guys, there a, was a wonderful show on TV that hasn't lasted, and they get these metal detectors. And as they're going along, you've probably seen them, and if it hits metal that's underneath the ground, it goes beep. Anyway, Howard was a retired engineer. Yeah, thank you. We, okay, let me just do that one. Okay. And as a hobby, he went all around the countryside with his metal detector. Um, and in England, as you know, there's something under the ground all the time, Roman coin or whatever. Anyway, so he's telling the story, and he, he goes, beep. Then he goes, he goes, beep, beep, beep. And 
he discovered that underneath in that plain old farmer's field, there was treasure. And it became known, has become known as the bitterly hoard. He dug it up and he knew enough that he had to go and get the archaeologist, the local archaeologist, which he did. And um, if you find anything that's considered treasure uh, in England, it belongs to the queen. She needs the money, so you can't, <laughs> you can't keep it. So he had to turn it over. It's illegal to, turn it, to keep it. So he turned it over, and I think he got 3,000 pounds, which isn't bad. <clears throat> And in this, sorry, I just wanted to, never mind me, but I wanted to show you this. What he found was a pot, a Thai pot. It was about this big, very, as big as a mug. Uh, it had disintegrated, but not so much so that you couldn't see what it was. In the mug, the pot, was a leather pouch, which had disintegrated. And in the pouch, there were 137 coins. Some of them were gold, some of them were silver, all of them dating from the English Civil War, which was a discovery. So of course, what Howard said to me was, nobody knows why they were buried there. And I've always said, saying that to a mystery writer is like saying catnip to a cat. So I said, really? <laughs> anyway, so I did some, re a little bit of research on it and uh, created a whole book about it. And it was absolutely fascinating. I think you can see how small it actually was and the fact that it had been buried there for 300 years. And it was a working field, it was plowed and everything, but it had never been unearthed. And what I did, oh yeah, sorry, I, I should hold on a second. What I did, which I'm sure any one of you would do, I thought, if I'm going to bury something and not be sure I'm going to come back, I have to make sure I remember where it is. So, um, thank you, thank you. Um, I thought you're either going to make a, a, a little map which, of course, many, many stories involve treasure maps, or you're going to tell somebody, or you're going to put it in a way where you will remember. So what I did was there were two very, very large, very old, what were they? They were not oaks, but mahogany. There were huge trees at the end, each end of this field. So. I started at one, I tried to imagine being a rather short Elizabethan and walked until I, 40 paces, I got to the middle and right directly behind me, sorry, you can't see, but directly behind me is a very conspicuous landmark, which is a hill, good place to stop. I went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right there was, sorry, is that the one with, the, yeah, can no. I just show just that one? Here? Yeah, no. no, no, I just want to show that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is my, oh, I see. you can see there's a depression there because how it dug there. But I think you can see Precy. Yeah. Anyway. You see it here. Right, so there are the two trees. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. You'd all do the same, wouldn't you? Yeah. Say, I've got to remember where this treasure is. So anyway, and I was very thrilled that it made directly halfway, directly in front was where the actual treasure was found. And then I was able to uh, go to, it's now in the little museum there, and uh, the archeologist handed me one of the coins. And again, I'm sure you can imagine what that was like to hold in my hand a coin that was 300 years old. Okay, so I think that's, I'm gonna finish with something in a minute, but before I do, I'd like to hear from you, because I could just go on forever. All right, anything, anyone, any treasure you've found? Anything? Leona. Um, I'm 
just curious. Obviously, you love to read and do research. So, is that what you prefer? Or how do you know I've done enough and I have to start writing now? Do you have a percentage of time that you say, okay, I'm going to read and research for the next year and then I'm going to write? How do you decide when to put that pen to paper? Because the editor says you have a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please hand it in in three months? Because it could go on forever. It, it, the, it's, yeah, I just have to do it. I know, but I am also looking for something. So I'm starting out with a concept like the book that I'm writing right now is 1937. So I know at least I'm going to be looking for something in 1937. That's my workhouse thing. So I know that, and then I just start walking in the woods, you know, and say, I, and always, oh, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, any other comments? I should finish in a minute, right? Um, I want to read you the, some final thing. No, any other? That, thank you. That. What, yes. What is your preferred methodology for research? Do you go to libraries, look at newspapers, Google? <laughs> what do you do? I go to the newspapers a lot, um, and as I said, I have a lot of, I go for instruction books. This, this book, which I don't have time to read you, is a it's facsimile, but it was a real book. This was when I'm doing my research into World War I, and again, if you can imagine, this was handed to a young officer, and I think, I will just read it to you actually, because again, it's one of those absolutely poignant things. So you imagine, you're a young man, you're 21, 22, you've probably had very little experience, you might have been at officer training school, maybe not. You're out there commanding a whole bunch of men, a lot of whom might be your age or even older, and somebody gives you this pamphlet. So, you, uh, anyway. One of the things that has always got to me is this, and again, you probably know this. Uh, at the time, in the First World War, it was quite a practice to give the men rum. And many, many men, unfortunately, uh, got addicted to, who weren't, because they were young, remember they were young, came out quite a, with an alcohol addiction. But they kept it on, and uh, part of the reason was, of course, it's a stimulant. So here in this little book, talk about poignant, under the heading rum, is instruction to this officer. And it says, the best time for a rum issue is in the early morning. Now that seems like a relatively innocent statement, but if you pull that apart a little bit, why is it best? First of all, there's an empty stomach, so the rum's going to be more powerful. Secondly, that was always the time when an attack would happen. And that's why you want your men all revved up, ready to go. Just give it to them in the morning. Not in the afternoon, not at night, in the morning. Um, this one I thought was... Sometimes they're so funny inadvertently because of the contrast between now and then. This is another instruction. It says, men undergoing punishment for drunkenness will receive no issue of rum for 14 days. So, oh, there's some perverted logic there. Anyway, so these, these books, like the one I showed you, um, they're, they're instruction books, so I, I, I go to them a lot. I go to the uh, newspapers a lot. Um, Google, not so much. You know. And as I said, they, they change your life. You know, this little book, when I opened this little book and there was that photograph, you just go, oh, I'm connecting. I'm connecting with the past. Okay, I'm going to finish by reading you again. It, it's a facsimile. So if you jump now, we're in 1942. And why I like this is the two reasons. This world has gone. 
But if you think about it, as of 1942, Americans descending on England. Now, I even remember the Americans. I remember that they were so gorgeous. I remember that feeling. They were better dressed. They were friendly. They had money. And you know that old joke, give us some gum, chum, was true. But they wouldn't give us gum. I forget what it was. They'd give us sweeties, I guess. Anyway, so when the servicemen are going over to England, never been to UK before, they're wonderful Americans, and they were given instructions on how to behave when they were there. And I, there's some of them are so funny, but I, I won't go into all of them. Okay, here are some do's and don'ts. History. If you're invited to eat with the family, don't eat too much. That might be their whole rations for the week. <laughs> don't make fun of British speech or accents. You sound just as funny to them, but they will be too polite to show it. Avoid comments on the British government or politics. Never capitalized. Never criticize the king or the queen. <laughs> and why I love this, that world is gone. Both sides, uh, you know, which isn't a bad thing, that, but they, we know much more about places than we ever did. And I think if an American person went to the UK and criticized, not the queen, but definitely not the queen, but criticized Prince Andrew, There'd be, yeah, 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 <laughs> as opposed to whatever. Anyway, it's an absolutely wonderful book. And as I say, it's just like stepping into another world, and you can touch it. You can touch the history. OK, that's it for me. I'd like to hear from you. And any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to know further about? I can certainly show you more books, but yes, please. What are you writing now? Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. OK, one of the, a bit of an answer to perhaps to what you said, and, and I do recommend this, as well as what I'm reading. I'm reading, and then I will get what I call the boing. I'm getting signals. I'll get. And it just, I love this actually, because one of the things that's so delightful is how different we are, how unique we are. Just a tiny example, not that long ago, a friend was talking to me about how excited she was about driving across the country. I couldn't think of anything worse than being in a car driving across the country. But that's great, because everybody is so different. So I find when I'm reading or whatever I'm doing, something goes, wow. And I know that that's important for me. And I literally write that down. This was something that really, it's that moment where you, I call it the boing boing, where you go, wow, that's really interesting. And somebody else might be going, oh, really, really, it's interesting, is it? But, um, I, I use that a lot, and in the what happened when I my latest series, which is set in 19, starts in 1936 Toronto with a uh, private investigator, female. I wanted to write as a female for once. Uh, I my Victorian I had to write as a Victorian detective, male, if I was going to set it in uh, 1890s because there were no females. So uh, it was nice to write as a female. Uh, I decided to go private investigator because it gave me a bit more freedom again of the time. There were women officers then and detectives, but very limited as to what they could do. So I started out like that, and then I'm looking around, and I came across a newspaper headline, July, 1936, there was a heat wave across North America, never heard, seen before or since. Like um, 
temperatures at night of 90 degrees. Really, and it didn't go on for maybe a couple of weeks, but I was very struck by that, the, how that would impact on somebody. And just put yourself back at that time period, not very much air conditioning. There was some, but not very much. So mostly people who were jammed into perhaps poor houses went down to the lake, and it wasn't really much cooler down there. So I, that was my Boeing, a heat wave. Um, and then in the third book, which will be out in September, called Cold Snap. Oh, sorry, yes. The second book, again, I'm not sure where I found this, but this might be something you've experienced. Uh, when a lot of the soldiers were returning from World War I, they were traumatized. A lot of them were traumatized. We call that PTSD, don't we? Whatever, you know what I mean. Post-traumatic stress, or, and or they were physically mutilated. And so what they did in Toronto at the time, they made these what they call blue benches, and they were literally painted blue, and the intention was that if there was a soldier who needed privacy, that was for him. Now, underneath that, the subtext was that some of these young men were hideous. So if you're walking along and you see this man sitting on a bench, a blue bench, the chances were he was going to be horrifyingly mutilated. So that was a big trigger. So that got me going there. And then in Cold Snap, the third book, that was this book that I showed you. This absolutely incredible book that I fictionalized, but it's the same thing again of um, war, brewing war, and what, it, what do we, can we do about it? So those are the things that trigger me. The one that I'm writing now, oh, okay. I'll share something personal with you, if I can find it. Sorry, I should be more organized. Uh, 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 hang on a second. I, um, I couldn't quite oh, it's up here. understand why I personally was so fascinated with workhouses. Still not sure, but perhaps my old therapist training, if you're getting a funny thing going on, you have to say, I wonder why I'm feeling that way. Anyway, I came across this picture. I don't know, it's later. Dress, I'd say, maybe 40s, two women, sitting by this little fire, it's English, there's a grid around it, and there's something about that picture that is completely compelling to me. So I'm trying to analyze it just a little bit, and I think it was because this one reminded me of my auntie, my mother's older sister, who I absolutely loved, exploring the whole world of the workhouse in Toronto, which it really existed. The, the depression was just slightly coming over. It's a very interesting time period. And all of the war clouds were coming in this side. And even I was surprised when I started to read how early, actually, people expected there was going to be another war. I'm talking 36, the war didn't happen for another three years, but there was a lot of talk about that people thought it was going to happen. So, so those are the things that started. I don't know quite how I'm going to weave it in there, but something, something about the workhouse, the poor relief. I discovered another little boing boing. I was reading a newspaper. And apparently, there's a wonderful church in Toronto called Trinity, Holy Trinity, and they're very, very socially active. And what it said was that at this time, a group of people, don't know how many yet, 
decided they would try to live on the amount of money that was being given to people on poor relief. And then they, I, they wrote about it. I'm really exploring that right now. And I know we've done, people have done that since then, more like that. So that one is in process. Uh, Cold Snap will be out, as I said, in September. Um, we've been lucky, we've been renewed with Murdoch for another season, which is amazing. I mean, I, I really, as I said, when we started out, I thought, will we get a season two? And now it's season 16. And uh, so, you know, ideas, yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, that's about it, please. Yes, a question over there, please. Have you ever made a cameo appearance in any of the episodes? <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't recognize me. <laughs> Sorry, I do have a funny story about that, if I may. Okay, this was literally because we thought, I think this was season five, and we thought the show was gonna be over. So one of the producers came to me and said, look, this is gonna be our last episode. Would you like to be in it? Because, you know, Alfred Hitchcock or whatever. So I said, sure. Season three, it was that early. Yeah, and really, really we thought that was it. So. Uh, okay, do you want to be somebody on a platform waving goodbye to Murdoch and Julia, or do you want to be in uh, the household as a servant? Not, you know, uh, I said, I'll take the servant, right? So uh, my mom uh, was a cook. Uh, she cooked in a school, so I said, okay, I'll be a cook. Uh, thinking of upstairs, downstairs. So I get out there, and uh, I, th I think, what, what's her name in the show? Is it Bates? No, it's not. Anyway, the cook. And she's a little bit, you know, plump. So I get there and they said, well, we want you to pad up, right? So that you, if you, that's your model, so, okay. So they gave, I'm, sorry, sorry, I'm glad you didn't recognize me. They gave me this hideous sort of straw red wig and this, hat, um, and then, this is a slightly intimate, but never mind. So I'm, ch I'm changing my clothes in one of the um, trailers that the actors use, and they come with this enormous black bra that I'm supposed to fill out, right? <laughs> and I said, yeah, no, no, I don't think so. Anyway, so I left it there, and then, one of the assistants came in, and it was actually the trailer for Tom Craig, who plays Brackenreed on the show. They weren't expecting him, which was why I was changing in his trailer. So anyway, so we hustle out. This is absolutely true. And I realized I had left the bra behind. So I guess Tom was going to come in and go, who's been here? <laughs> Anyway, that was called, that was the one about Beaten Manor. And, I, and I, as I said, I, I played a, a cook. And there was one very surreal moment where, you know, I'm part of the extras and I'm standing here and there's Detective Murdoch and he says to us, does anybody know what happened? And I go, yeah, well, actually. <laughs> Anyway, it, I, I don't want to do it again. That, that's, that was fine. I'm very happy to have done it, but that's it. It's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> the first thing I picked up, certainly, is your wonderful, dry sense of humor, <laughs> uh, which comes through in almost, uh, well, certainly the way you present and uh, all your wonderful stories. I think uh, uh, from the Black Ace to uh, the Nautical Cookbook, uh, uh, to the Pittman shorthand, to many other uh, incentives uh, that provoke your writing oh, and imagination, and uh, all your creative, uh, get all your creative juices running, uh, which uh, which happens, leading of course to your enviable, enviable successes in so many venues. Thank you. Uh, we're all, uh, our many of us are Murdoch mystery watchers, and uh, <laughs> and certainly I've read two or three of your books already. 
So on behalf of the uh, Cobregan District Historical Society, uh, please accept this uh, small token of our appreciation. And um, uh, thank you so very much for oh, thank uh, you. coming in from Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, before you have a rush up here, we would like to allow Maureen a moment to go back to the table, at which point then uh, you can uh, perhaps purchase a book, speak to her for a minute or two, and get your, uh, your book inscribed if you wish. So thank you once again, and may we show our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you. You've been absolutely wonderful, and I'm sorry I forgot to show you my pigeon book, but we'll, we'll do that next time. Thank you.